We're very happy today to have Greg Moore from Rutgers, and you can see his title here, N equals two star super young males and four manifold invariants. So go ahead, Greg. Uh, thank you, Edward, for the invitation. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about a project I've been working on for a few years with Jan Manscott. And this is a progress report on that project. And it's closely related to work in these papers. You'll notice the, uh, they date from the mid to late 1990s. And after I gave a talk on this project in the competing seminar, the one that competes with the Institute Monday seminar series, namely the Western Hemisphere Colloquium, last July, it was pointed out to me that there, in the last, just in the last few years, there's closely related work by m several mathematicians. And I'll come back to that work at the end. It's quite interesting. So let me begin with some motivation. So let's uh, begin by recalling the glorious history of the relationship between super Yang Mills theory and four manifold invariants. So the story begins with the discovery of instanton solutions of the self dual Yang Mills equations, 1975. And then in the hands of the Oxford School at Mathematics, that led to the discovery of Donaldson invariants in the early 1980s. And then Michael Atia asked some very perceptive questions, which were answered by Edward Witten. And he showed that the, the question was, how can you interpret the Donaldson invariants physically? And the answer is that uh, they're correlation functions in a supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. And in the process, Edward invented the concept of topological quantum field theory, although ironically, that example does not fit into what mathematicians understand as a topological quantum field theory. That's an interesting discussion for another time. Nevertheless, it started the subject. Now that was a very nice observation, but um, it formulated the Donaldson invariance as correlation functions and a strongly coupled quantum field theory. So it wasn't that useful for actually evaluating the Donaldson invariance, but all that changed in a dramatic way in the spring of 1994 when Zyberg and Witten did give an effective description of the low energy uh, dynamics of these theories. And that in turn led to the discovery of zyberg witten invariants in the fall of 1994, which in turn led to the revolution of 1995. And here I'm not talking about the string theory revolution of 1995, <laughs> I'm talking about the revolution of four manifold theory of 1995. Um, and it was so dramatic that I think it left many physicists with the impression that all problems in four manifold theory have been solved by the physicists. But that's really not the case. Um, for example, a major outstanding problem is the smooth Poincare conjecture, which remains unresolved in four dimensions. And there's a host of other problems. I'll just mention one for fun. It won't pay, play a role in the rest of the talk, but there's something called the 11 eighths conjecture which says that if X is smooth and spin, well, if X is smooth and spin, it's, it's well known that the intersection form, the intersection form that calculates intersections of surfaces in this four dimensional manifold, the intersection form has to be of this form, some number, some integer number M of copies of the E8 plus E8 lattice, plus some number of copies of the intersection form of S2 times S2. And then the conjecture says that uh, N is bounded below by three times M, so it's saturated by connected sums of K3 surfaces. And there are many other open problems. So that in, in 2006, a leading expert in this subject, Ron Stern, uh, wrote a paper with this title, and I don't know for sure, but I suspect that if he wrote, if he wrote a paper now, he would, might be still satisfied with this title. So the question is, can physics help with some of these open problems? So 
we don't really know, but the Zyberg Witten revolution was based on uh, pure SU2 n equals 2 supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. On the other hand, the basic idea of topological twisting applies to any four dimensional n equals 2 quantum field theory. So, th is there more to learn about four manifolds from supersymmetric quantum field theory? So, that's the, the motivation. Now, indeed, we have learned more by studying other theories. So by including couplings to, by including hypermultiplets in the simplest possible way, we discovered the superconformal simple type phenomena. We don't know yet if physics will help with the big open questions, the big open uh, questions, but it's worth a try. And certainly we'll learn many new things about supersymmetric quantum field theory along the way so the way I like to think about it is getting there is half the fun. So that's the motivation. So now I want to say things about uh, the setup, preliminaries, and background. So the four manifolds that we're going to consider are smooth, compact, oriented, and without boundary. And for simplicity, but certainly not for necessity, for simplicity, they'll be connected and simply connected. Now, we're also going to assume, as in Donaldson theory, that X admits an almost complex structure. And that's not actually a very stringent condition. It's really a simple topological condition. It means that the second Betty number, B2 plus, is odd. So B2 plus, if you introduce a metric, you can talk about self-dual two, uh, degree two cohomology classes. And so B2 plus is the dimension of the self-dual degree two cohomology classes, or, or if you think in terms of intersection theory, it's the maximal positive, uh, the, the, the maximal dimension of positive subspaces of the second cohomology space. Importantly, we do not assume that X is spin because a lot of the fun questions have to do with non-spin manifolds. Let me say a word about what is an almost complex structure. So an almost complex structure means that if you allow yourself to multiply one forms by a complex number, or more formally, you consider the complexification of the cotangent bundle, then you can find locally a basis of one forms, EI, I running from one to two, such that EI and EI star uh, form a basis and transform across patches by action of a U, U2 matrix. And then there's a standard homomorphism of U2 into SO4, so that if you apply this, you get transition functions for the oriented cotangent bundle. Now, on a complex manifold, you can find holomorphic coordinates, ZI and Z, I bar, such that the EIs are proportional to the DZIs. But on an almost complex manifold, there are no ZIs, there are no DZIs, but they're still the EIs, so you could still talk about P, Q forms. Let me give you a quick reminder about n equals two star supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. So in the bosonic part of the Lie algebra of symmetries, there's an SU2 plus plus SU2 minus for local Lorentz transformations, an SU2 R symmetry, and if it's a super Yang Mills theory, there's a gauge symmetry. Now in n equals two star, the hypermultiplets are in the adjoint representation. So in our case, the hypermultiplet scalars will be in the adjoint representation of SU2 and made quaternionic. Now, we can right multiply on the quaternions by a unit quaternion, and so that's the action of the SU2R symmetry. So that means that if we assemble the quaternions into a doublet of two complex scalars, it's a doublet of SU2R. That's important because in topological twisting, we couple to a background SU2R gauge field. We do that in such a way that we can identify the SU2R symmetry with the SU2 plus in the local Lorentz algebra. And that means that our hypermultiplet scalar fields become spinners under topological twisting. So that raises the question, what if X is not spin? Well, in this case, you can cure the problem by introducing what I'll call an ultraviolet spin C structure. Ultraviolet because we need to introduce this spin C structure 
a gothic SUV just in order to define the topologically twisted theory path integral in the ultraviolet. So now I'm going to take three slides and remind you of a few things about spin C structures. So first of all, the group spin C of four is pairs of two by two unitary matrices of equal determinant. And there's a homomorphism from spin C of four to SO four, which is very similar to the very standard and well-known one from spin four to SO four. So if you take a vector in R4 and you make it into a quaternion, then you can multiply on the left and the right by U1, U2 inverse. The phase cancels out because the determinants are equal. And so it's just like an SU2 action. So that defines an SO4 rotation. But the kernel of this homomorphism is U1. So by definition, to give a spin C structure is to give transition functions on your manifold valued in spin C of four so that if you apply this homomorphism, you get the SO4 transition functions of the cotangent bundle. Now, here again is spin C of four, and it rather obviously has two two-dimensional representations. I can take the fundamental of each of the two U2 factors. So then if I'm given a spin C structure, these define what we can call chiral spin bundles. I'll call them W plus and minus. And those, those bundles, they're rank two bundles. So if we take the, the determinant bundle, that could be a non-trivial complex line bundle. It has a first turn class, and that's called the characteristic class of the spin C structure. And with a little index theory, you can show that C squared minus twice the Euler character minus three times the signature divided by eight is an integer. And that integer will be very important to us. Um, I'll call it L. Are there any questions at this point? Actually, I have a question, Brad. Yeah. yeah. Basically, to, to introduce a spin C structure usually means that there's a U1 physical symmetry that you're using. Yeah. That must be one of the R symmetries, I assume. No, it's a U1 baryon symmetry. It multiplies the hypermultiplet. Oh, it's yeah. a global symmetry. Of the it's a global symmetry, absolutely. Correct. Of a hypermultiplet. Correct. Absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Um, now, another little math fact is that an almost complex structure defines a canonical spin C structure. And the way that works is um, you can write a nice homomorphism, phi, from U2 into spin C4. So the, the first element is just the unitary matrix itself. And the second one is this funny unitary matrix with the same determinant as U. And then you can check that if you compose with the homomorphism to SO4, it's conjugate to the standard embedding of U2 into SO4. And for that canonical spin C structure, this integer L, which is important to us, is zero. So now the hypermultiplet scalars in the n equals two star theory are gonna be spinners in the chiral spin bundle W plus. And it was understood, I think, by Labastida and, and Mourinho back in the 90s that you need a a spin C structure to define the topologically twisted theory, but the detailed dependence on SUV has not previously been discussed, and for good reason, because including it turned out to be quite non-trivial. Now, there's an interesting lesson here. For n equals two star theory, you see the basic topological twisting of Witten needs to be supplemented with extra data. In this case, it's a, a, that spin C structure. And it's not known, at least not to me, how to twist the general four-dimensional n equals two theory. So it's clear that you have to introduce extra data, and I understand it in some cases, but say for the general class S theory, I actually don't know how to topologically twist the theory. That's one interesting open problem. So now let's come to the topologically twisted partition function. So what data do we need to formulate the partition function? Well, this is a super conformal theory. So in the ultraviolet, there's a coupling constant. I'll call it the ultraviolet coupling constant, tau uv, and, and it, it, the complexified coupling constant is a point in the upper half plane. And the associated exponential of it is called q uv. And there's an n equals two preserving mass term. So there's a mass in the complex numbers and it's not widely appreciated, but even in this super conformal theory, we need to introduce 
an ultraviolet scale lambda, and indeed, our topological correlation functions enter the theory only through the, ra the dimensionless ratio m over lambda, I'll call that t. As I've explained at length, we need an ultraviolet spin C structure, but it will only enter our correlation functions through the characteristic class of the spin C structure. Sorry, Greg, yeah. mm -hmm. isn't, this, isn't this theory n equal to four superior mills in the UV? Uh, well, it depends what you mean. If you ignore the mass parameter, if you take the mass parameter to zero, then yes, it's n equals four super young mills. But w w why do you need a UV scale? Maybe uh, be because, uh, basically, because the mass you can think of the mass as a la Zyberg. You think of the mass as uh, the vacuum expectation value of a weakly coupled U one. And that weakly coupled U1 is not super conformal. Um, a more technical answer is that if you try and write down the, um, the prepotential, then there is actually, you'll find that you need to include, if you try and get the mass dependence of the prepotential really right, then you'll find that you actually need to introduce this UV scale. Now, Juan, notice that M equals zero which gives you the n equals four super young mills theory, then the lambda doesn't matter anymore. So maybe that'll make you feel better. Is that okay? Um, uh, no? <laughs> okay, I didn't understand why you needed You didn't that. understand what I said? No, 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 I, I think I understood uh, what you said, but I, 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 okay. I, I thought you would tell me there is maybe some diversions, some new diversions that... Um, uh, unlike Juan, I didn't understand your answer to Juan's question, so I would appreciate Okay, it. this is bad. Okay, I don't want to take too much time on this. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident about this. Um, so, again, what is this mass? Think of the mass as a, as a VEV of a weakly coupled U1. So I'm sure Nadi understands that. Now, you need to think of it this way in order to get the correct mass dependence of the prepotential. But if you've got a weakly coupled U1, then that is not super conformal. So there are terms in the prepotential. No, it's weakly coupled in the limit that its coupling constant goes to zero. Well, that's the definition doesn't... of weakly coupled, yes. Well, but in that limit, it doesn't, you don't need to introduce that scale. Uh, no, not true. There's a log of M squared over lambda squared. And charge fields under it, this will also, it will also, um, it will also appear in the um, Nekrasov derivation of the prepotential. We went through that extremely carefully with Xin Yu Zheng. And there, maybe one will feel better because there is a kind of divergence at one loop that needs to, you need this um, lambda. And look, the mass parameter, I'm, I'm gonna be writing down topological correlation functions, so they better not be dimensionless. I guess the hypermultiple is charged under this U1, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. So um, let's not get hung up on this. Um, if you don't like lambda, set it to one. Okay. Um, so and then the last piece of data. So I'm writing down the data that you need for the topological partition function, and the, they will be functions of t. If you don't like what I said about lambda, just substitute m for t. And the last piece of data I need is the Tuft flux, because I, because the SO, because the SU two theory par partition function will have an Tuft flux. Okay. Now, of course, if we're going to write the path in the Lagrangian and the path integral, then you also need to introduce a metric. But the energy momentum tensor is Q exact, so the metric dependence should drop out. And in the same vein, the action for this theory is not only metric independent, it's holomorphic in tau uv up to q exact terms, so we also expect z should be holomorphic in tau uv. This theory also has q closed operators. So we have operators associated with points. If phi is the vector multiple uh, scalar field, so it's adjoint valued, we can insert that at points, we can sum over points. If we have a surface, we can introduce, we can integrate over the surface of trace of phi times f these turn out to be Q-closed. And not only that, the Q-cohomology class of these things only depends on the homology of your sum of points or your surface. So 
the path integral defines a function that depends on the four parameters, uh, nu, tau uv, cuv, and t, from the homology into the complex numbers, and it's just the correlation function of e to the o of x, where x is the homology class, o of x is the corresponding operator. We look at the generator of its correlators. And so this is the function that Jan and I evaluated very explicitly and used it to check some physical expectations. So now I'm going to go over the main physical expectations and the main lessons that we learned from the explicit results. Um, are there any further questions? We can come back to the, to the lambda later. Um, OK, so first. In their paper, Zyberg and Witten showed that the zyberg witten curve for n equals 2 star is invariant under S-duality. So what about the partition functions? Well, the partition functions are indeed suitably S-duality covariant with some interesting non-trivial details, which I don't think have uh, been in, appeared in the literature previously. But I've, I've talked about that a lot in previous talks on this project, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over that. Now, the second one is, well, Zyberg and Witten also noted that, unsurprisingly, as the mass parameter goes to infinity, the hypermultiplets decouple, and you get the pure super yang mills zyberg witten curve. Technically, you take QUV times m to the fourth. You set that equal to lambda naught to the fourth, where lambda naught is some fixed scale. Take m to infinity and q to zero. And so the question is, does the limit of our partition function exist and give the Donaldson-Witten partition function. The Donaldson-Witten partition function is the generator of the um, cor uh, generator of Donaldson invariance that comes from the pure theory. And the answer is yes, sort of. The limit actually does not exist, but z nu is actually a sum. Well, when b two plus is bigger than one, z nu is naturally a sum of three terms. You have to throw one of them away in a natural way and renormalize the other two, and then there's a well-defined limit, and it reproduces the Donaldson-Witten function with an interesting orientation issue that we won't get into related to the Tufte anomalies of one-form symmetries in modern language. Now, a is third the, question. Is the one that you throw away, is that the one where S2 is Higgs? Because phi has a div? Yes. Thank you. It's the um, at large mass. It's the it's the one at weak coupling, right? That's we're talking about the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that one. Um, okay. So now, uh, as I mentioned before, the action is of this form. So the natural question is the part is the partition function metric independent and holomorphic in tau. And the answer is yes, when b2 plus is bigger than 1, and absolutely not when b2 plus is equal to 1. In fact, most correlators vary continuously with the metric. So if you look at a correlation function like this, with fixed r and n, uh, it varies continuously with the metric when n plus r over 2 is sufficiently large. In other words, it's bounded, bounded if, it's, if it's larger than this integer l that I defined before which means all but finitely many correlators are actually not topological, but we can derive very explicit formulae for the holomorphic and metric anomalies, so we understand very well how it depends on metric. I should say something very similar was observed by Edward and me in the NF equals four case also. Now, again, using Q-symmetry, the couplings to the background spin C connection is expected to be holomorphic in the coordinate on the Coulomb branch, usually denoted U, so you take the trace of the adjoint scalar squared, you take its vacuum expectation value in a vacuum on the Coulomb branch, call that U. And going back to Shapir and Tachikawa, we expect that the low energy effective theory should have holomorphic couplings, kappa 1 and kappa 2, where capital F sub S is the background spin C connection, and little f is the dynamical U1 field strength on the Coulomb branch low energy effective theory. And here I'm using Zyberg's convention of small letters for dynamical and capital for background. OK, the answer is yes, kappa 2 is holomorphic. No, kappa 1 is not holomorphic. 
And at least for me, personally, this is a huge big deal. Um, so let me stress this. So I think a, an important physical principle is that the measure on the Coulomb branch is physical and should be single valued. The Coulomb branch is physical, and I think the Coulomb branch measure should also be physical. And you shouldn't have to go to something like a finite cover of the Coulomb branch to get a good measure. And this is highly non-trivial because several of the couplings in the low energy effective theory are multi-valued. In fact, there's not even a global duality frame. There's not even a global notion of what is the photon. So it turns out that with holomorphic couplings, there's no single valued measure. So it's a kind of anomaly. I don't know how to phrase it in terms of the standard theory of anomalies, but to me, it's a kind of anomaly. As I'll explain later, this has important implications for the class S generalization of these results. And by the way, we also give very explicit formulae for these couplings, which are non-trivial. Finally, the m to zero limit should be some kind of topologically twisted partition function of n equals four super Yang mills. So what do we get? Well, the T or mass dependence turns out to look like this. There's an overall factor of t to the minus 3l times a function z tilde, which has a good t goes to zero limit. So it's going to blow up or go to zero unless little l is equal to zero. So a non-trivial limit only exists when the spin c structures are determined by an almost complex structure. And in cases where we can compare, such as projective surfaces, the limit does indeed reproduce the waffle witten invariance. Why waffle witten Why should waffle witten have anything to do with it? Well, as m goes to zero, as we just discussed, we get n equals four super Yang Mills. Waffle witten is the is the renowned topological twisted partition function of super Yang Mills theory. But this is actually a little surprising because the Donaldson witten and the waffle witten twists are very different, and moreover. Contrary to what I said in the competing seminar in July, the Q fixed point equations um, are actually different in general. I'll come back to that point. Greg, before yeah. you go, concerning the anomaly, hmm? you left us hanging a little bit. You said that some couplings aren't holomorphic. Yeah. Single valued or whatever. Yeah. But I guess the physical things are in the end. So I assume that the coupling. Well, I'm talking about holomorphy in U. Yes, I just said that. But okay. Well, the measure, I mean, the measure involves du du bar. The measure is not holomorphic at all. But I would have expected, and for a long time, I expected that these couplings would be holomorphic. Okay, but is there something you're going to tell us that uh, explains why they're not? Is it because there's some... I, 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 I'm going to show you what I believe are the correct couplings. Mm -hmm. And again, the best way to think of it is think of the mass as the vacuum expectation value of a weakly coupled uh, U1. Yes. So uh, if you think of it that way, then you write the action for a higher rank low energy effective theory. Yes. U1 times U1. One is the dynamical U1 on the Coulomb branch. The other is the U1B, the U1 baryon number. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as you know, you have uh, you have uh, tau bar times f plus i f plus you have tau i j f plus i f plus j plus tau bar i j f minus i f minus j, mm -hmm. and so that's basically my explanation of why uh, it's natural that this is not holomorphic. Okay, thanks. But it um, I, before I had thought about it that way, um, Jan and I were going crazy <laughs> trying to write down a holomorphic kappa such that the measure would be well single valued and we kept missing by eighth roots of unity i'm confused by something here yeah mm -hmm. the, the object that is not holomorphic is it does it have to be holomorphic if we assume supersymmetry well it's the usual q symmetry arguments suggest that it should be holomorphic if i did not do any twist i would just took the theory without the twist is there a corresponding Coupling in the yeah, theory sure, 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 sure. And is that holomorphic? Sure. This this f sub s is just the uh, some background spin c connection. So it yeah. involves gravity or not? Is it the question in in rigid supersymmetry? It's, 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 no, it's 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 
This, this, this is a question, uh, Nadi, this is a question about the low energy effective action when I'm coupling to external gauge fields. So just by rigid supersymmetry, you say it has to be holomorphic. You don't need supergravity. Oh, I didn't say that. I'm asking. This is uh, no, I don't think that's true because I think we have a supersymmetric low energy effective action, which is not holomorphic. And so let me let me repeat what the answer is. And I mean, I, unfortunately, I don't have an iPad to write equations, but let me say it in words. You know that if you have a higher rank theory that you don't, you don't have a tau, you have a tau ij. And you don't have a single photon, you have a multiplet of photons. It's called them F upper i. So you shouldn't be surprised that you have the kind of uh, effective action like um, tau lower ij, f plus upper i wedge f plus upper j, plus tau bar lower ij, f minus upper i wedge f minus upper j. I'm saying that's exactly what we have here once you realize that that mass, um, once you realize that um, this f is the field strength for this U1 baryon. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm writing down the effective action for a but, but U1 Greg, for whatever it is, theory. it should come from a prepotential. It does. And the yes, prepotential does. should better be holomorphic. Okay, you guys are getting upset about exactly the same problem. <laughs> this prepotential uh, is really the prepotential from for an SU2 times weakly coupled U1 theory. And that one is holomorphic. Well, of course, the prepotential is holomorphic. Okay. So, yeah. what is not a holomorphic? This effect, this coupling and the effective action is not holomorphic. Nadi, I think we're being told that the puzzle gets resolved by writing the answer. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I forgot to put the timer on my on my clicker, so I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so, uh, why don't you harass me about this after after the talk? Okay, with um, pleasure. All right. All right. So um, I want to say something about more precise mathematical formulation of the partition function. So what does it look like to a mathematician? So uh, we start with a principal SO3 bundle, and our fields are a connection on the SO3 bundle, and I'll call it a monopole field, which is a chiral spinner valued in the, uh, which is adjoint valued and complex. And so then the Q fixed point equations look like this. So these are the, well, the, these are the non-abelian versions of the uh, zyberg witten equations. They're called the non-abelian monopole equations. And so if we fix the second stiefel whitney class and a Toff flux and an instanton number, then we have a well-defined moduli space of solutions to these monopole equations. And so now mathematically, our partition function is a sum over non-negative instanton numbers of q to the k with certain integrals over these moduli spaces of e to the mu of x. So mu of x is a map from the homology of the four manifold to the cohomology of the moduli space. It's an analog of the famous Donaldson mu map. And then an Euler character, actually an equivariant Euler character of a bundle associated to those differential equations. And so then the standard argument for why this is true is that the path integral has a Q-symmetry. So the path integral is a, an infinite dimensional um, tome class, which localizes onto this finite dimensional moduli space of solutions of the monopole equations. So I want to say a, a little word about this moduli space. So if you calculate the virtual dimension of the moduli space, it's two times our integer L times the dimension of the gauge group, three in our case. And I want to stress that it's independent of instanton number k. And that's kind of funny because the moduli space of instantons goes like 8k, but the index of the Dirac operator goes like minus 8k, so the k dependence cancels out. And that's very important because it means that correlation functions for any given insertion of an operator, even the partition function itself with no operators, becomes an infinite series in QUV. There's no uh, ghost number anomaly that in Donaldson theory, picks out a particular instanton uh, number for any given insertion of operators. It's very unlike that. And that's, of course, important for S-duality and modular invariance. 
These symmetries also, these equations also have an important U1 symmetry where I rotate the monopole field by a phase. So this U1 acts on the moduli space, and this mu of x is actually in the equivariant cohomology, and it's the mathematical core counterpart of the physical operator O of x, and the physical parameter m over lambda is the equivariant parameter, the U1 equivariant parameter. So uh, if we localize with using that U1 symmetry, then we look for the fixed point set under rescaling the monopole field by a phase, and there are actually two branches. First of all, clearly if I put the monopole field to zero, that's a fixed point. And if I put m to zero, I get the instanton equation. So inside this moduli space, mqk is the moduli space of instantons. So that's one branch of fixed points. But we can also have another branch where the monopole field is non-zero, but upper or lower triangular. And then multiplying by a phase is equivalent to a gauge transformation. So that's also a fixed point. And we'll call that the abelian branch because the equations boil down to abelian zyberg witten equations on that branch. Greg, in that last statement, that that's a fixed point, you assumed that the gauge field was diagonal, I think. Uh, yes, yes, yes. You have to have a reducible connection. That's right. Absolutely. Well, that's part of the statement. That's why we call it abelian, the abelian branch. OK. Yeah. So, um, so the U1 localization looks like this. You have a sum over the instanton and the abelian branch. Um, and let's first focus on the instanton contribution. Then um, we can take, it's interesting to look at the mass to zero and infinity limits here. So this equivariant Euler class, we can write out as a product over the splitting classes and write that as a polynomial in T, which I've written this way to pick out the various churn classes. So now it's nice to observe that if the, if the mass goes to infinity, then clearly the leading term is the zeroth churn class, which is just one. So if I replace the Euler class by one, well, I get e to the mu of x, and lo and behold, that's the definition of the Donaldson invariance, a la Donaldson. So on the other hand, if I take m to zero, then I get the top churn class. And if I take the almost comp if I take the spin c structure determined by an almost complex structure, then this bundle E is the cotangent bundle of moduli space. So if I take m to zero, I should get something like the Euler character of the instanton moduli space. Now, famously, the waffle witten invariants compute the Euler character of the instanton moduli space. And moreover, they're S-duality covariant. So it's natural to guess that we get the waffle witten invariants. But as I said before, that's kind of odd because the waffle witten twist of N equals 4 super Yang-Mills is different from the Donaldson-Witten twist. And let's just look at the um, waffle witten equations. So what are the fields in the waffle witten equations? We have a, a connection on the principal SO3 bundle. We have an adjoint-valued scalar field C and an adjoint-valued self-dual self two-form B. And then here are the equations. And they don't look very much like the cyborg witten equations, but it helps a lot to use the almost complex structure because then we can introduce a form called the almost Kähler form, which is like a Kähler form, but it's not closed. And then you can write the general self-dual two form as a scalar field little b times omega plus a, the real part of a two zero form. Remember, if you have an almost complex structure, you can talk about PQ forms. So then if you add in the scalar, there's a complex structure on the space of fields and holomorphic coordinates are C plus IB and beta two zero, which I've suggestively put into a doublet. As I explained before, an almost complex structure also determines a canonical spin C structure. And if you look at this diagonal matrix 1.u, you see that the pullback of the chiral spin bundle is, is the trivial bundle plus the two zero forms. So it makes sense to identify the, the waffle witten and the zyberg witten fields this way. And indeed, if you do that translation, the first of the zyberg witten equations becomes the first of the waffle witten equations. But um, the second equation is more troublesome. The second waffle witten equation looks like this. And if you put it into this language, the second zyberg witten equation looks like this. So contrary to what I said this summer, uh, Zyberg is not the same as Waffa. I really ought to have known better. But they're pretty close. Um, the difference of uh, this connection on B with D star 
is, uh, is a zeroth order in derivatives and a tensorial. So, you know, it's easy to make a mistake here. So almost complex geometry is almost impossible to understand, largely because of the nine house tensor, which is almost impossible to pronounce. Anyway, um, the topological invariants appear to be the same. So our conjecture is that the moduli spaces are in some sense equivalent. And that's actually quite an important remark, if true, because ever since the waffle witten equations were introduced, we've been bedeviled by the non-compact branches where B and C are turned on. But if we have this equivalence to the adjoint cyber witten equations, then they have an SO2 symmetry and working equivariantly with respect to that SO2 symmetry, might be able to, we might be able to tame the non-compact branches. So that's a subject for the future. I should say that for projective surfaces, in recent years, mathematicians, Tanaka Thomas and Golampur Shishmani Yao, um, gave precise mathematical definitions of the waffle witten invariants, but they used very heavy duty algebraic geometry and those techniques will not generalize to the uh, more general four manifolds we're talking about. Okay, so I've got about 15 minutes. So I just wanna say a little bit about how we get these explicit results. And um, I'm gonna have to touch go lightly because I don't have much time left. So you see the partition, so the story starts with what's called the Coulomb branch integral. So the partition function on a compact manifold will be equal to a sum over all the vacua. In particular, we need to integrate over the Coulomb branch of vacua. So we'll have an integral and it turns out to have this, this form, B is the Coulomb branch. So H is some holomorphic metric independent function, which we know all about, but I'm not gonna tell you about. And Psi is a non-holomorphic metric dependent theta function like object, which I will tell you a little bit about. So today the Coulomb branch is just the Coulomb branch, it's just the complex numbers. But the generalization to class S is not known, but should be interesting. So what did Cyberg and Witten do? They said that we can understand the low energy dynamics by writing down a, a family of elliptic curves. So think of them as C mod Z plus tau of U Z. So tau is holomorphically varying with U. And uh, generically they're smooth elliptic curves, but at three points they degenerate. Now remarkably, you can invert this tau as a function of u to write u as a function of tau explicitly in terms of theta functions. We don't need to know the explicit formula, but the, the end result is that the, the Coulomb branch can be identified with the modular curve for the congruence group gamma of two. So let's choose the fundamental domain for gamma of two like this one here. And then the three points where the elliptic curve degenerates or tau goes to I infinity tau goes to zero and tau goes to one, our measure will be singular at those points and it will also be singular at tau uv. So we wanna integrate over this, over this pink region. So our measure looks a little like this and I wanna talk a little bit about this uh, psi function. So to zeroth order, it's just the partition function of the low energy Maxwell theory. So it's the sum over the topologically inequivalent fluxes of e to the minus Yang Mills Maxwell action. So it's frame dependent, you have to choose a photon. It's not holomorphic, it's metric dependent, but it's not very metric dependent. It, the metric dependence is entirely through something called the period point. What's the period point? Well, if B2 plus is bigger than one, the Coulomb branch integral is zero, we don't need to worry about this, but if B2 plus is equal to one, that's when it's non-zero. And then when B2 plus is equal to one, the second cohomology space is Lorentzian. And so there's a unique cohomology class, degree two cohomology class J, which lives in the forward light cone is norm square one and is self dual. So the Hodge dual depends on the metric and therefore J depends on the metric, but that all the metric dependence comes through J. Now using J, you can write down self dual and anti self dual projections of the dynamical field strength. So a better approximation to the psi function is this one here, uh, where you're summing over fluxes or more precisely, you're summing over first turn classes of the low energy photon line bundle. 
Here's a more precise formula. The capital E is a function I'm not going to tell you too much about. It's some kind of error function. The important thing is that all the metric dependence on non-holomorphy is an E, and it's a total derivative. It's naturally, in a very natural way, it's a total derivative with respect to tau bar. The rest is holomorphic and metric independent. Lambda is the first Chern class of the dynamical photon. Z is CUV for the background spin C structure times a function V, which I'll tell you more about on the next slide. So lambda dot Z is a coupling of the low energy photon to the background spin C connection. And if you write it out in full glory, this is partially an answer to uh, the question that Nadi was asking me about before. Here's the coupling of the background spin C structure to the dynamical photon. As I was stressing, it violates some, photon, uh, some folklore. And what is V? V is the second derivative of the prepotential with respect to A and M. So again, to address questions that I was being asked about before, you'd better know the right M dependence of your prepotential to write this down. You can write this down in terms of special Kähler coordinates, and Jan discovered a remarkable identity for this V. If you consider the ratio of these theta functions and insert V and tau, two tau precisely, then that actually is independent of where you are on the Coulomb branch. It's, a, if you like, a renormalization group invariant. So it's constant. That's how that turns out to be a very useful fact when proving that our Coulomb branch measure is single valued. As I mentioned before, this, this coupling has important implications for class S. So if you take the mass goes to infinity limit of this coupling, then the V goes to a constant. And so what happens is you recover, recover a plus or minus sign. That's all. And in fact, it's the famous plus or minus sign, the famous sign that Witten introduced in his paper on abelian S-duality to explain S-duality of just Maxwell theory. From the six-dimensional point of view, it comes from a Z2-valued quadratic refinement of the intersection form that's used in defining the self-dual two-form in six dimensions. But we see here that actually in the n equals two star case, which of course should also come from six dimensions, we're getting something that's actually um, uh, C star valued. So that means that the two zero theory, I suspect that the, the, qu the correct quadratic refinement of the intersection form for the two zero theory should be a, involve a U one valued quadratic refinement. Okay, um, very little time. So let me just tell you a few quick things about how you actually evaluate the Coulomb branch integral using mock this and that. So I hope you'll believe me that the Coulomb branch integral boils down to a sum of a bunch of integrals of this form. You're integrating over the fundamental domain of SL2z of some power of the imaginary part of tau times a series, which is explicitly known and has a nice q and q bar expansion. can have negative powers in q and q bar, but it's bounded below. And how are you going to do this integral? Well, a good way to try and do the integral is to try and do it by integration by parts. So you try to write the integral m tau to the minus s f as a total derivative with respect to tau bar, some h hat. And then you're left with an integral over the boundary, the blue boundary region here. And that's pretty useless uh, unless the h hat is modular. But if the h hat is modular, then the finite boundary contributions will actually cancel thanks to modular invariance, and you're left with an integral across the fundamental domain from minus a half to a half, but large m tau, and you take the limit to infinity. Now that, so it looks like it's no big deal, right? So you just got to solve that first order differential equation. Okay, now this is really just an exercise in first year calculus. You can find a function r, which is vanishing exponentially fast, and solve this first order differential equation. There's no big deal here. You can just write it down explicitly in terms of indefinite uh, gamma functions. But then what happens is that r is not modular. On the other hand, the differential equation is modular. So the failure of r to be modular, it better be some holomorphic shift. So that suggests that there's a holomorphic function h of tau, such that h of tau plus r is modular. And such an h of tau is what's meant by a mock modular form. Everything has a nice Fourier expansion here, so h of tau will have a nice Fourier expansion. So if you can find h of tau, you're home free. 
You write the integrand as a total derivative, as I just explained, all of the finite boundaries cancel. You're just left with the boundary region at infinity, and that gives you the constant term in the Q expansion of the Mach modular form. Now, notice that it's undetermined by the differential equation fixed by modular invariance, so it's slightly subtle. But it's all pretty elementary. So that's the technique that we use to evaluate the Coulomb branch integral. We write the measure as d of a one form. Our one form had better be well-defined, no monodrama or anything like that. It better be non-singular away from the points where we know there's going to be trouble. And it better have a good Q expansion near the cusps. And these conditions determine this g-hat uniquely as a modular completion of what's called an appel lerch sum. This h of tau does not look very modular, but remarkably, it has a modular completion, non-holomorphic modular completion. And uh, it also looks like it has lots of nasty poles in the z, and it does. And that turned out to be a major technical headache, but rather magically, because of that identity of Jan's that I showed you before, the um, the bad things from the poles actually go away. Anyway, for the ultraviolet spin C structure determined by an almost complex structure, we find expressions that look like this, where G nu is the famous kind of mock modular form that we learned about from Zagier, and thus we reproduce results of Waffe and Witten. But we can also generalize to other spin C structures. So for CP2, we get other kinds of holomorphic anomalies. And we can also introduce operators. So for CP2, here's the result where I've introduced various powers labeled by n of the point operator. So if I don't introduce any powers of the uh, point operator, I just have the partition function itself. That's the first line. And that indeed is the waffle witten answer. On the other hand, I have all the rest of the thing, this uh, table where I do insert various powers of the point operator. And if I keep the terms that survive the m goes to infinity limit, then um, I get the Donaldson invariance for uh, the point operator on CP2. So the green are the waffle witten invariance, and the red are the Donaldson invariance, and the rest is some generalization. All right, so five, six minutes. I want to say a few things about the low energy effective theory uh, near the cusps and what our explicit results look like. So as we learned from the zyberg witten paper, near each of these three cusps where the elliptic curve degenerates, the description of the vacuum changes. We instead have a U1 vector multiplet coupled to a charge one hypermultiplet in a suitable duality frame. And there's a separate contribution to the path integral coming from the path integral of each of these three low energy effective theories. We add up all the contributions because, I said, as I said before, we sum over vacuum. So that's the general form of the partition function, the Coulomb branch integral that we've discussed so far, and then a contribution from the three uh, low energy effective theories value, value, valid near the three cusps. And in fact, when B2 plus is bigger than one, the Coulomb branch integral vanishes from zero, fermion zero modes and all we get are the contributions from the three cusps. And those are true topological invariants. So of course, it's quite interesting to determine what these are. So we're trying now to talk about the low energy effective theory, which is valued in these small red regions of the Coulomb branch. Now near these cusps, we can introduce a local special, co special Kähler coordinate. And our effective action will be a sum of a bunch of couplings, little f n, multiplied by little delta n, where little delta n are the possible local topological densities. And that's true up to some q exact stuff. So if I know the fn's, then when I evaluate this, um, the partition function of the, this low energy effective theory, by say localization, I'll set a to 0. And the exponential of little f is big F. And the topological invariant associated to little delta n is big delta n, delta, big delta n. So what are the possible topological couplings we have to worry about? Well, because we have a four manifold, we have the Euler character and the signature. And that leads to the famous a to the chi and uh, b to the sigma 
uh, couplings that were introduced by Witten. But now we have this ultraviolet spin C structure and uh, a tough flux, and so we have some more couplings to worry about. And then the low energy effective theory has a photon, so it has a first turn class. I'll call it the infrareds uh, C. It's actually a spin C structure, so it's the infrared spin C structure, not to be confused with the ultraviolet one. So there are some more couplings. And then if we include observables, there are four more couplings to wor worry about. So altogether, the contribution at the cusp J is a sum over the U1 photon topological class, the C infrared, of the zyberg witten invariant of C infrared, that's an integer, times the product over these 12 couplings. Sorry, what, why are the UV and the IR spin structures not, spin C structures not the same? Um, why should they be the same? I introduced a, an ultraviolet spin C structure just to get off the ground, just to define the theory in the UV. But, um, you know, we're, we're summing all over all the vacuum solutions. So we have to sum over all the topological sectors of the U1 photon in the infrared. I mean, this, this sum over C infrared is just like the sum over the first turn classes of the low energy U1 photon in that theta function I talked about before. Right, I'm, I'm evaluating a partition function. I have to sum over all the contributions of all the different topological sectors of the infrared fields. Does CIR depend on dynamical fields or only classical values? CIR, so in, 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 in the infrared, as you taught me, uh, the, there's, there's a dynamical photon, right? Right. Also, also in the theory, which is value, valid in the neighborhood of um, the point UJ. So there, there's a photon there and a U1 theory, and it has a, it has a first turn class. It's, a, it's, it's really a spin C connection, but, um, but loosely speaking, we can think of it as a U1 gauge field, and it has a first turn class. And we should sum over all the all, all over the field conf, uh, all, over all the topological sectors of the infrared. Oh, I I see why I was confused. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Good. So, um, okay. So so we, we we sum over that. I should say that. Well, okay. Maybe I'll. Okay. There's there's a, a renowned a formula for the Donaldson invariance in terms of the zyberg witten invariance, which Edward wrote, which in mathematics is called the Witten conjecture, and it involves something very similar to this, where you have a sum over CIR um, uh, over CIR. Okay, I'm going to ignore that chat because I'm running low on, on time. Uh, so, uh, so you have a sum over CIR, and, um, and instead of this product over these uh, 12 functions, you have some simple trigonometric expressions. Well, I'm com yeah, I, I don't have time to really do it careful comparison. So this is the kind of thing you get. And um, now how do you get these, how do you get these couplings? How do you get these couplings in the low energy effective action, these little FNJs? Well, there's a trick, I think an underappreciated trick that Edward and I used in our paper from 1997, where you can get these couplings by using the wall crossing behavior of the Coulomb branch integral at UJ. So the basic principle uh, is that the metric dependence should only arise from the boundary contribution at u goes to infinity. And if you buy that, then you see there's, there's some metric dependence, some variation of the Coulomb branch integral coming from singularities at uj. And when b2 plus is one, there's also metric dependence from the cyborg witten contribution. But those two things should balance each other and this turns out to be a very strong condition. It's strong enough to determine all 12 couplings. So to summarize, your, your, your partition function looks like this. Each contribution of each cusp looks like this. And um, here is uh, it, what the results really look like. So in the boxed equation at the top, I show you the contribution from the cusp at u1. And the main thing to get from this is that I'm, I'm writing various modular functions raised to the power, and the powers are various topological invariants. 
the box equation on the top has no insertions of observables. If I include, for example, the surface observable, then I have in the exponential uh, s dot cir times various modular functions, which are listed in the second table, or s squared times various modular functions, or s dot cuv times various modular functions. So that's what the results look like. So now, um, oh, I'm over, over time. Um, okay, so a few minutes, but I can take a few minutes. Okay, so um, let me say real quick something about relation to other people's work. So for um, the canonical spin C structure determined by an almost complex structure and the mass goes to zero, we recover and generalize formulae from the Waffle Witten paper and also from a nice paper of Dycroft, Park, and Schreuer's for the Waffle Witten invariance. When CUV is zero and our manifold is spin, uh, we recover formulae that were written in by Labastida Lozano. As I mentioned before, in the M goes to infinity limit, we recover the Witten conjecture after suitable renormalization and, and uh, fudging. Um, fudging in the sense that you have to throw away the, um, the contribution from the cusp U1. Uh, the, the discussion on mock modular forms generalizes and to my mind explains much more systematically some observations about relations of the U-plane integral in special cases to mock modular forms from the 90s. And so it's a generalization and unification of these results from the 90s, but more recently, in the last year, there have been some physical derivations of the holomorphic anomaly in the waffle witten theory by these two papers. Uh, so ours is, a very, is an independent derivation of the holomorphic anomaly. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there's been some parallel work, which we were until recently very completely un unaware of, by um, mathematicians, Goethe, Kuhl, Nakajima, and Williams. And it's very interesting to compare with their results. So on the one hand, we're talking about general four manifolds. They're talking about projective algebraic surfaces. They use heavy duty algebraic geometry. They use this Mochizuki theory. We have an arbitrary spin C structure. They have the canonical spin C structure determined by the complex structure. Um, but once, once, but when we can compare, remarkably, as you saw, these formulas are actually quite complex, and they're bang on, absolutely the same. It's, it's pretty amazing. Moreover, the mathematicians did something we didn't do, which is they gave a further refinement of the invariance by computing the chi y genus of the moduli space of sheaves. And it would be very interesting to see how to do that from the physics point of view, especially since the result involves infinite products, which are nowadays uh, called, um, well, they're related to things that uh, Zagier has called quantum modular forms. So the other thing that comparing with their results shows is that the instanton contribution can be identified with the results at the cusps U2 and U3 and the abelian contribution from U1. So the instanton contribution alone cannot be S-duality covariant. Okay, so let me conclude. So I already said this. Um, this next statement is unfortunately a time translation invariant statement. The Hamiltonian formulation of these theories is, uh, should be a very interesting thing to understand better. And as I've said several times during the talk, uh, the six dimensional point of view in the generalization to type, to class S ought to be very interesting. And finally, as I just mentioned, when X is complex, there are these very interesting refined versions and it would be quite interesting to get those from physics. So that concludes the talk, thank you. Um, thank you, Greg. So uh, let me turn it over open for questions. Uh, I had one, this chi y generalization that you mentioned. Before, yeah. Is it something that has a path integral realization in four dimensions? Or would you um, try that's dimensions? part of my question. Yeah, I, I have some thoughts. I've discussed that with Jan a bit, but. Um, Nothing concrete. It's you know you know you get you get things like the McMahon function where you have a products of one minus q to the n to the n, 
and even worse, you get products of one minus q to the n to the n squared. Um, so it would be very interesting to reproduce that either from a path integral or maybe from BPS counting functions. But I wonder if they do BPS counting functions in four plus one dimensions. Something like BPS counting functions in four plus one dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's they're, they're a little reminiscent of these these infinite products that you get from, from the halo picture of BPS states. But again, that's a four dimensional picture. Yeah, I really don't know. I think it's, I mention it because I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting open problem. Um, anyone else with questions? Yeah, I'd like to still understand this anomaly, this holomorphic anomaly better. So, oh, okay. Uh, is it present also in local quantities or only when you integrate over the U plane? No, it's local. I mean, depends what you mean by local. I think of the measure, the Coulomb branch measure is a local thing. There we go. But, but Here's then the I'm really puzzled. If I think of it in on R, put the theory on R4, mm -hmm. it is rigid supersymmetry with some background gauge here. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, is the pre, are you saying that the prepotential is not holomorphic or not? Yeah, Nadia, I, 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 I don't really understand why you're bothered by this. You're not bothered by the fact that tau and tau bar enter non-holomorphically. That's correct. It's the same thing. But the prepotential is holomorphic. The, absolutely. So you you didn't you didn't bother me when I wrote this formula for the Maxwell theory, right? With tau bar of u and tau. This doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother you. Well, the other one shouldn't bother you either, because it's just tau ij. It's just a tau matrix. But then I'm not surprised if it's not holomorphic. Well, okay. I mean, <laughs> I that what is holomorphic is in hindsight, it's obvious when you fall off a roof that there's no gravity. I mean, you, know, you can't. No, but the question you. Yes, yes, in hindsight, it's obvious. In hindsight, no, no. it's totally obvious. Yes, I agree. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry I said it in such an obscure way. Um, I said it, I mean, I, I was really, we were really going crazy because we thought, you know, there are these Q, 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 Q symmetry arguments that said that these couplings had to be holomorphic. And then we were saying, okay, well, what? What possible holomorphic function could we put there that made the measure single valued? And the answer was, well, we couldn't find one. And then we said, oh my God, wait a second. Let's think about it, a la Zyberg and Ann Nelson thinking about a background uh, VEV um, and a weakly coupled U1. And then, 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 as you say, it became obvious. Okay. That's why you say, look, Nadi, okay. look at, I'm, look I'm at not the formula. Now. Let, let me make it more obvious. Look at the formula for V. It's the second derivative of F with respect to A and M, right? There's no reason for this object to be holomorphic. I thought you were surprised because it there is. There is, well, okay. Very, very, very smart people said it would be holomorphic and very dumb people like me believed them. And for two years spent uh, spent, tried to find a holomorphic function to make the measure work. Okay. And and moreover, I mean, so the, you know, and as I say, the fact that this coupling is not holomorphic means that the generalization of Witten's phase here is is non-trivial. So I think that's going to be an important aspect of the generalization to class S theories. Uh, are there any, sorry about the phone ringing in the background here. Are there any um, other questions? I was wondering if you could say something about uh, floor theory that you mentioned on your very last slide. Unfortunately, I can, I, I, it's a great question. And unfortunately, I can say very little about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to make a remark here about um, just an amazing historical irony. 
which is if you go back to Edward's paper, mm -hmm. if you go back to Edward's paper where he introduced topological field theory, it's very interesting to see how he starts, how what, the, the, the chain of logic he uses. He starts with floor theory. Mm -hmm. He starts by saying there's floor theory and he writes, then he writes down a Hamiltonian for a quantum field theory, which should give you this floor theory. And then he says, oh my God, this Hamiltonian is a topologically twisted, is the Hamiltonian of a topologically twisted n equals to supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, <laughs> and, and the reason it's such an irony is that um, this, this is at the heart of the reason that this is actually not technically a topological quantum field theory because you can't define it on all four manifolds. Well, there are technical problems with defining floor theory um, on general three manifolds, like the three sphere. So, um, you know, this is, this is a topic where there's been a great deal of activity in the, in the mathematics community. And now there's a huge number of, of versions of floor theory. Um, but uh, I, I think it would be it would be a good thing for the physicists to revisit this because they might bring some new insights. But right. So not, um, more than that, I really can't tell you anything more. Okay. Well, yeah. So that's what I was wondering. I mean, there's like many versions of floor theory. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In particular, I think uh, this is what's called instanton floor theory. Well, I mean, what I would be, what I would think that. What you're talking about is that maybe there's an equivariant generalization of monopole floor theory because uh, you described the low oh, energy. Oh, absolutely, there is, there is, there is, there is, there is. I, um, I see. I even think it was discussed at the Park City, um, Park City Institute, uh, right? What two years ago? They had a lot of talks. If you remember, they had a lot of talks about floor theory, including I, certainly equivariant monopole floor well, theory was so mentioned. Well, I'm not sure if they discuss exactly what you're talking about, which is where well, I'm like that, not this particular theory. Yeah. Yes, that's why I'm listing it as an open problem. Yes, yeah. mathematicians, with one significant exception, mathematicians never, never pay attention to the generalizations with hypermultiplets. Mm -hmm. The significant exception is the work of Fian and Liness, where mm -hmm. they're studying the cube fixed point, but they're not doing the Hamiltonian. Uh, but they're studying the Q-fixed point equations for the non-abelian uh, Zybert-Gwitten equations where you have uh, one, one hypermultiplet in the fundamental. Mm -hmm. right. And that to try to prove the formulas that come by comparing the UV to the IR theories. Exactly, so, right. So it's an old idea of Pitzdragach and Turin. The original idea, well, I showed you that we had this, these, I mean, that whole discussion I had before about fixed points and the abelian and the instanton branch, you know, th th doesn't de that applies to any cyborg um, um non abelian cyborg? Here we are, any non abelian cyborg theory. And so that's exactly the idea. So the idea of Pitzdrach and Turin was oh ho, uh, when m is zero, we have the instanton moduli space. Um, but then there's this other set of fixed points. And so then we can hope that uh, the, the moduli space is some kind of cobordism from uh, instanton moduli space to the abelian cyborg witten moduli space and thereby explain the Witten conjecture. And, and, and they've essentially been successful. It, it took a lot of hard work, but they've essentially been successful in implementing that idea. We're, we're, we're looking at it slightly differently. We're looking, we're integrating over the non-abelian instanton moduli space and we're getting contributions from the two branches like that. Uh, are there any more questions? In that case, we'll thank Greg again and we'll reconvene um, for a discussion in 10 minutes. If anyone wants to join the discussion and doesn't have the link, send me an email and I'll send you the link. Okay, see you in 10 minutes.